chapter number 3. Proverbs chapter number 3, please. We're going to read verse 30. And right now I need some different men who will read some different passages of Scripture, if we can do that. Uh, can I have somebody that will read Genesis chapter 13, verses 7 and 8? All right, Mike Presgrove. Um, how about Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15? All right, Chick. I'm going to read Acts. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. Neil. And then I'll have Brother Perisher read James chapter 3 and verse 17. And I think that's good for now. Um, there was another verse that I was supposed to have on here. I do not, I do not see it. Um, no, it's not that one. I, I, may, I may find it here in a minute. Uh, Romans 12, 18. How about that one? Um, all right, Stephen, I'll have you do that. And uh, let's read Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 30. There the Bible says, Strive not with a man without cause, if he have done thee no harm. Strive not with a man without cause, if he have done thee no harm. The message tonight is simply, Strive not without a cause. Strive not without a cause. Uh, let's pray together. Lord, I ask that you'd help us tonight. Lord, I pray that... Uh, Lord, I pray that you would give me strength. I pray that you would give us understanding of this passage. Uh, Lord, be with us. Be with those uh, that we've prayed for and that we've lifted up to you tonight. I pray, Lord, that we would have uh, clarity and understanding, Lord, of what you want us to know and understand here uh, according to your word. And I pray that we would apply what it means to uh, be at peace, Lord, and to seek uh, to be at peace with all men. And so, Lord, I pray that we would take these things to heart. Help us to understand them, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Unnecessary strife can bring about a great host of problems in our lives that otherwise could have been avoided. The word for strive here in our passage, as we see it, literally means this, to toss. That's the root word, to toss, and it has a figurative application of wrangling or grappling with. Quite simply, it refers to entering into altercations with people, and we would typically think of verbal altercations, at least to begin with. Hopefully it wouldn't go any further than that. Uh, but we think of two people who are uh, in disagreement, who are at odds, uh, who are not friendly to each other or have ceased to be friendly to one another, who are uh, just really uh, not looking out for the other's best interest and who have become enemies. Maybe at one time they were friends and now they're enemies. And unfortunately, this can happen in life. There will be times where it's unavoidable. Sometimes we can't help but get into some kind of strife, even when we don't look for it. And that's a part of living in a sinful world. We're going to be uh, at odds with people at different times. However, we shouldn't be looking for it. We shouldn't have this desire to strive against others without a necessary reason for doing so. God's Word actually commands us against doing that. Now, sometimes there's a necessary reason for doing so. Sometimes we have no choice but to have difficult conversations with people that might lead to some real disagreement. And uh, we don't look for that. We don't want that, we hope. But some people might, and some people seem to strive and uh, off strife, and they seem to enjoy being at odds. Well, God's Word commands us against this, where it says, Strive not with a man without cause, if he have done, uh, done thee no harm. So let's think about this tonight for a few moments. First of all, we see this, Strife must not continue amongst brethren. Who has Genesis chapter 13, verses 7 and 8? It's 
So read that one more time if you don't mind. I yeah, from the top. And I want you to pay attention to something that kind of almost seems like it's fit in there, just kind of thrown in there, but listen. Okay, I, I'm assuming we were all listening there. Did anyone notice a phrase that kind of just jumped out and being willing to share it? Janet? Well, that's a really good one. That's what I'm getting to the main point, but there's something that seems to not even fit with the rest of those verses. Yes, Dorenda? Yes, the Canaanite. It, it, you're hearing about the herdsmen at odds, and they're not getting along. And uh, Abram has to finally say, hey, we shouldn't be doing this as his brethren. Right in the middle of all of it, we hear, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt in the land. I wonder why that's there. Well, remember, the Canaanite and the Perizzite, they're not God's people. Abram and Lot are God's people. You'd expect the Canaanite and the Perizzites to be striving against one another. But if they're going to watch Abram and Lot, who have a lot of wealth and seem to have a lot of uh, giftedness from God and by God and uh, a lot of blessings from God, get, not getting along and being at odds and striving against one another in the same way that they're used to doing, I wonder what kind of testimony that gave to them. I wonder what that spoke of the Lord to those who were not God's people. There's a great thing that we can learn here, and that's this. This type of strife can be hurtful to the cause of Christ as our testimony can be at risk. Our testimony is at stake, and I don't want to lose my testimony for the Lord because I'm acting just like the world. I have come too far to go back to the old man. God has redeemed me from far too much to go right back to who I was. And yet sometimes we still do. We still try to. That old nature is there. The old man creeps up. And I find that when I'm really working and trying with the help of God to defeat the old man, then the temptations are as strong as they've ever been. And Satan loves to throw things in our uh, existence that will cause us to maybe, uh, you know, maybe lose our testimony or have it be at risk or whatever it might be. And striving, that's what the world does. We need to work to not have that happen amongst the brethren. Now, we can apply that to blood family relationships, but that also applies to the family of God. We are brethren. There should be none of this striving against one another as the world does. That just cannot and must not happen. So I've written down this, work to resolve misunderstandings and problems with people when they arise. And I would say as much as possible as soon as they arise. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. Who has that? Okay, so if your brother trespasses against you, the passage says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he'll hear you, you've gained your brother. That's what we want to see done. That's how we deal with things. Listen, inevitably, we are going to offend somebody. Somebody's going to offend us, sometimes unknowingly, at other times knowingly. But when these moments happen, and they arise, and they will happen, and you might be the nicest little person around. You might be the nicest, sweetest person in Mechanicsville, and someone's still going to do something mean to you. You know, I, I, there, you know, there are some people I just say those people should never have a mean thing happen to them. But unfortunately, they do because that's the world that we live in. Unfortunate, mean uh, things happen to people. <coughs> so when this happens amongst God's people, our job is to go to the person. No matter how awkward that might seem, no matter how difficult that is, go to the person and work to resolve the issue with that person. That's the right way to do it. 
and don't tell anyone else that you're going to go talk to that person because they offended you. It's not their, not their business yet. Now, the following verses say that if you go and your brother is not going to hear you, then the next step is to take two or three witnesses with you to try to get that resolved. And this passage even can work its way into church discipline and how we deal with people who are living in sin. And if they're not hearing the rebuke and the instruction that's being given to them and they refuse to repent or change what they're doing, uh, then the matter is supposed to be taken before the whole church at that point in time. Not with the intent of trying to humiliate anybody, but with the intent of trying to help that person stop their behavior in its tracks so that it can end there and then they can be restored. And uh, if that ever has to happen in a church, uh, then it should be done in that way. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the right way to deal with things. Uh, we've never gotten to that point. Uh, as a church, you know, in, in our almost 16 years, we've never had to, uh, you know, pull a person in front of the entire church because they just wouldn't listen and they just were not being obedient. Uh, times where we have had to confront folks, they've had a very repentant heart. And that's the right way to do it. That's what churches ought to do. But it begins before all of that with two individuals. If you have had an issue with somebody, then it needs to be resolved. And go to that person alone. And don't spread amongst everyone else that you're having problems with this person. I, I, I put this question underneath here for us to truly consider it. Are we actively practicing this Bible command? We must. It's interesting to me how many Christians don't follow this. Many would rather go talk about somebody. That's the wrong way to do it. Many would rather go share their issue with everyone and anyone else other than the person. That's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to go directly to the person. And as far as I know, there's nothing like this that needs to be taken care of in our midst or with anyone here. I'm just preaching tonight because this is where we're at. Strivings can be dealt with between two people. And we ought to work to try to have it resolved. Sometimes, although rare, the answer is to separate. Now, don't misunderstand me tonight. I'm not suggesting that spouses separate, okay? That's not what I'm referring to. Uh, I'm not condoning separation or divorce or anything like that. I'm talking about between, you know, two believers that are not married, but two believers who uh, are brethren in Christ, uh, and they're trying to work on something, they're trying to have an issue worked out, and it just seems like there's, a, uh, there's an impasse, and the issue can't be resolved. Sometimes the person with the forgiving heart has to just let that be, you know, and the, the nature is such that you don't need to go any further with it, and you just, well, I guess they're not going to recognize what I perceive to be wrong I'm going to recognize what I did to be wrong and leave it with the Lord. You know, I've had that happen with me. I've had people that have wronged me that I thought, and, and I had been wrong to that person, and I apologized, and I thought for sure they're going to apologize too. Well, they didn't apologize. Didn't need to or didn't think they needed to and weren't about to. That's hurtful. And in, in the mindset of the person who apologizes and bears their heart and says, hey, here's where I did wrong by you, and the other person just says, all right, okay, you know, or all right, well, thank you, and, and never acknowledges what they did, that's where it's probably very, very difficult. But you know what? That's where grace just says, let it go and give it to God. Sometimes that's all we can do. I've had it happen. I'm sure you've had it happen. My hope and prayer is I have not been the other person to someone else. And we have to just give those things over to God. We must say, Lord, I, I really wish that person would own up to what they did wrong and acknowledge it and at least apologize and just realize there might be some times in this life, this side of heaven, where you'll never get that. You know what? God's in control. Leave it to the Lord. Be the more forgiving, big-hearted person. Be the one to apologize, even if you thought the other person should but didn't, and just leave it. Sometimes that's the best thing we can do. Hey, we've, we've done right where we've needed to do right. I'm just going to leave it and let God take care of the rest of it. Sometimes, however, separation does happen, and uh, I don't think it's something that should happen very often, 
but sometimes it, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's really the best way to move forward. And in our mind, it might not be something that's really good, but God might want that for a very various reasons. Maybe he needs to use both people in different places. Notice, Abram and Lot, along with their herdsmen, divided. And Abram went one way and Lot went another way. Now later on, Abram would, would have to come and bail Lot out and you know, he'd have to come help him and come to his rescue and everything else, unfortunately. Uh, but they divided. Some, that was, seemed to be the only answer that they had at that point in time. Paul and Barnabas also came to a place in their relationship where they decided to do the same thing. And in Paul and Barnabas' situation, it doesn't really seem like there's a clear right or wrong person. Acts chapter 15. Turn there with me if you can. I want you to see this. When we think of Paul and Barnabas, we always think, what a wonderful relationship between two missionaries, the Apostle Paul, the great church planner of the early church, and Barnabas, son of consolation, the great encourager who never said a crossword to anybody, who was able to get along with everyone. Well, sometimes we forget there was some big tension between Paul and Barnabas at one point. And in Acts chapter 15, we'll begin reading in verse 36. There the Bible says, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, this is after their first missionary journey, they're about to go on their second. Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Now notice verse 39. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming <coughs> the churches. Here's two men of God who the contention between them is so sharp. The contention was over John Mark. <coughs> Excuse me. The first missionary journey, I've got a little bit of allergies or something, so just excuse me tonight. I've been fine for two years. I've been avoiding everything, and I think maybe something, some kind of outside allergy got me. But the contention was so sharp between the two of them that they can't agree about John Mark, because John Mark was kind of the young ministry man in training who left them at the first missionary journey, just up and left. He couldn't cut it. And he got out of there. And Paul never forgot that. And now it's time for the second missionary journey. And Barnabas says, hey, let's take John Mark. You know, I can almost imagine Barnabas being the encourager that he is. I think he's ready now. I've had some great talks with him. And I think, I think he's really ready to go. And uh, I can see Paul saying, oh, no. Absolutely not. He up and left without hardly saying a word. Left us high and dry. We needed a lot of help. And he was out of there. There's no way he's coming with us. And Barnabas saying, well, wait a minute now, Paul. I mean, if, if I hadn't done all that I did with you and helped to ingratiate you to the rest of the church, you wouldn't even be who you are today. Remember? It was Barnabas and others who helped the church to accept Paul. And uh, I don't know that Barnabas said that. I would probably feel like saying that. Paul, get a hold of yourself for a second. Remember who you were? You held the coats of those who stoned Stephen. You are a persecutor of God's people. And now you can't give this guy a second chance? Now, many of us might look at that and say, well, Barnabas probably had a good point. But Paul is saying, hey, I, I can't trust him. I might want to have him, but he's proven who he is. He's never even come to me and acknowledged that he did wrong. You know, And so we don't know all the extenuating, extenuating circumstances. And the Bible never makes it clear who was right or wrong in this instance. Maybe neither one of them were wrong. Maybe both of them were right. And the Lord needed to divide these men so that they can get the work of God done in different places. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes the Lord does that. Now, I am a person who's all about galvanization. I like to get everyone together and keep them together and all that kind of stuff. I like to see... Uh, a lot happen in, in one place, and, and I, I think that's a great thing. But sometimes God works in these situations where there is some contention, 
and we just have to give that to God. We're not looking for that. We don't want that to happen. But sometimes the Lord's involved in all that. Maybe you've had some difficult confrontations with Christians in the past, and maybe all of that has led you to where you are here now. Well, good. I'm glad you're here. Had those confrontations not happened, you wouldn't be here tonight. So I'm glad the confrontations happened or the contentions happened that led you to this place, because here you are, and we love having you here tonight. And you're right in the place where God wants you to be. So let's move on. Number two, God's servants must not be contentious. Now we know there was, we just read of there being contention between Paul and Barnabas, but we have to work not to be contentious for contentiousness sake. Who has 2 Timothy 2.24? Read that one more time. The servant Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. A defining characteristic of God's servants is gentleness. Gentleness. This reflects the character of the Lord. We read about the wisdom of God in James 3.17. Who has that? Greg? Greg? One of the characteristics of our Lord is clearly gentleness. And I want to ask, are we gentle? Or are we harsh? We can make a wrong assumption and think that being gentle portrays weakness. Nothing could be further from the truth. Being a gentleman is what every man here should strive to be. Every man here at Truth Baptist Church should strive to be a true gentleman. Be mindful of others. Hold the doors for uh, women and for children. Be kind and gracious to little ones. Have a smiling face. Be a kind-hearted individual. A gentleman. That's what God wants for us. And we need to work at that. And because sometimes we not, might not always feel that way. And we might get hurried, or we might get frustrated, or something might come into our life that would cause us not to be that way. Well, God wants us to be that way. And we must work to be a true gentleman. Now, maybe we buck up against that because we think, well, that's being a little sissy. You know, that's, that's being a namby-pamby. That's, you know, being a wimp. And uh, no one wants to be that... You know, no man worth his salt wants to be a wimp. No, it's not being a wimp. It's reflecting the true strength and character of the Lord. Being Christ-like reveals strength, not weakness. And no one should mistake gentleness and kindness for weakness. But we should be as harmless as doves, but as wise as serpents. We should... Walk quietly and carry a big stick. We should offer opportunity and kindness and graciousness to everybody. But then if somebody is going to uh, come upon us or try to do harm to us or those we love, then we'll reveal that we're not weak at all. Very strong. But work to be that gentle person and that gentle soul that God would have us to be. Along with this quality is an aptness to teach. Apt here in 2 Timothy 2 refers to being instructive. So being a gentle person isn't just being this quiet little wallflower who doesn't have any uh, you know, influence and does or says nothing. That's not it at all. As a matter of fact, the gentle Christian has usually, an, uh, and the servant of God who's gentle, has an aptness to teach. Apt here in 2 Timothy refers to instruction or being instructive. Patience is mentioned here as well. It should also be demonstrated by his servants. Patience. Being willing to let people come to the place that they need to be. Now, pastors won't make it if they don't learn some kind of patience. Because you're ministering in the same place 
for many years, and especially if you stick with it and stay in the same place. You know what you find out is people need to be, you need to be patient with people. And you got to be patient with communities. And <laughs> the servants of the Lord are supposed to be this. Sometimes you'll see the spirit of an evangelist, and some pe- men are called to be evangelists. And I would say a man who's called to be an evangelist and go from church to church and preach should never try to be a pastor if they don't have the calling to be a pastor. They're, those are different callings. Callings to preach might be similar, but calling of, uh, you know, of, of your place in ministry, an evangelist, a, a pastor, teacher, those are different things. And we need to work at being patient. Now, maybe you might say, I'm neither one of those. Well, you are a Christian. You're a servant of God, whether you're a pastor, preacher, teacher, or not. And all servants of the Lord are supposed to be patient. So let's be patient with one another. Let's give grace to people. Let's give people space to come around. Let's give people space to be able to get to the place of maturity that they need to be. Because we need that as well. We expect that, and we should give that to others. Third and finally, we have a responsibility to live peaceably with everyone. And so we see Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. Stephen, do you have that? So, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, Live peaceably with all men. We have a responsibility to live peaceably with everyone. I like those phrases, as much as lieth in you. It refers to, as well, with all that we have. First, we need it to be possible. Because the Bible says, if it be possible, sometimes it's impossible, not from your side of things, but from someone else's side of things. They will not allow you to be at peace with them. But as far as we're concerned, everything should be in place. We should be able to be at peace, and we've taken care of all of that. We need it to be possible on our side. We also need to pray and seek out the possibility of peace with everyone we can. Is there anything left undone with anyone? I wonder if we're not at peace with someone, and maybe there's something we've not acknowledged or we've not made right, or we have not come around to talking about. Well, I put down here, be the initiator. Be the one to reach out, and be that person uh, who makes the contact and who makes uh, the, the uh, the opportunity to get together and to work things out. Second, we need to do so with all the strength and ability that we have. So as much as lieth in you, it refers to with all that we have, uh, with everything, all that God's given you, use it all to try to be at peace. You know, sometimes you're going to have some people that, you know, this doesn't make sense. You don't know why. But you should at least make it clear that you've done everything that you can. Uh, to be at peace with people. And, you know, I, I've been here for a long time, 16 years as pastor of this church, and, you know, we've, some people have come and gone, a lot of people have come and stayed, but for those that have come and gone, I've always tried to say, you know, I want to make sure that they know that I love them, I'm not against them. Um, if I see them, I'll try to purposely make a point of talking to them. I saw someone just last night. Uh, and uh, that I hadn't seen in a long time, who was an instrumental part at the beginning of our church and had a real nice, kind interaction with that person. You know, We should try to do that. Be the person who is always extending the olive branch. Be the person who doesn't burn down the bridge. Be the person who says, you know, whatever I can do to make sure that I am in a right relationship and I'm right by those people, I am going to do it. I don't know what I had for this blank. I didn't fill it in, so excuse me. With great blank, we are to be at peace with others. I don't know why I don't have that. And uh, I had an idea. I don't want to just put something in there that wasn't what I originally thought. So with great something or other, (laughs) great love in our heart, that's a good one. Um, 
great grace. Maybe that's good. I don't know what I was thinking, but we are to be at peace with others with great everything. How about that? And uh, be at peace. God wants that for us, okay? And uh, be that individual. Be that person. Be the peacemaker. God will bless your life for it. Listen, we have about five, about 10 minutes or so. Let's get together with some people and pray tonight, and then we'll dismiss.